Welcome everybody to the short educational video on hinge loss support vector machines and the loss of users. We want to highlight in this video the concept of the so-called hinge loss for neural network training. Then we want to show how this is related to support vector machines and how we can use that to design entirely new loss functions such as the loss of users. So generally we need loss functions in order to enable training of neural networks. And the loss function essentially tells us how good our current parameter set actually is for the given purpose of the network. So let's say we have a parameter set W that describes the weights in our hidden layers and all the connections of our network. Now the loss function actually tells us if we give it some inputs uh, x and some desired outputs y, how we can use w to derive from our inputs x our desired outputs y. Now the loss function tells us how well the produced output actually fits our optimal output y. So in order to update our weights, we can now find this minimization problem such that we minimize this loss with respect to our training data set and find an optimal parameter set W. Generally, we do this in the concept of gradient descent, where we compute the gradient of our loss function with respect to W and use that in order to update our current estimate of the estimated parameters. So generally, this yields to an optimization strategy where we can update our weights in an iterative way and then slowly converge towards a local minimum that will hopefully yield a good performance for our given task. So the hinge loss is a special loss function, and you could say it is an uh, relaxation of the non-convex 1-0 loss. So the 1-0 loss will count a loss for every misclassification with 1 and for every correct classification it will simply discount it to 0. So unfortunately this is a non-convex optimization problem that is pretty difficult to solve and the hinge loss here denoted in red is a convex relaxation to this problem. Formally speaking, we can express the hinge loss as a maximum between 0 and the term here on the right hand side. So this is 1 minus, and now um, y hat is the prediction produced by the network multiplied with the correct prediction, and this is weighted with the distance to our decision boundary. So you could say this term here will become very strongly positive if you have a misclassification as indicated in our figure here. So the further we are away from the decision boundary in an incorrect classification will introduce a very high loss. While if we have a correct classification, the term here on the right hand side will become negative and will be eclipsed to zero by the maximum operation. So every correct classification that is far enough away from the decision boundary will not cause any loss at all. So you could say that this function accepts correct input equally and punishes misclassification in a linear fashion. Now let's relate this to the concept of support vector machines. Support vector machines are a classical method from traditional machine learning. The idea is to find a decision to classify between two classes by finding the so-called optimally separating hyperplane. So let's consider the example here on the left hand side. We have two classes demonstrated by dots in blue here and in red here. Now we want to determine the decision boundary that separates those two classes in an optimal way. In order to describe optimality, we desire 
to actually maximize the margin between those two classes indicated by the dashed lines here and here. Formally speaking, we can now describe this hyperplane for decision as this simple linear equation here shown on the right hand side. So we actually compute the sign distance to the respective hyperplane. So let's see what's happening in this equation. Actually, we just compute the inner product of the normal vector with some vector x and add the bias b. This will give us the signed distance to this plane. Now, given that we can classify with a negative sign one class and with a positive sign the other class, denoted here as yn, we can simply find constraints such that points are correctly classified in the following way. We compute the sign distance of the point to our hyperplane, and for the case of a negative sign distance and a negative class membership, we multiply the two and get a positive number. So we actually want to have this positive number to be greater or equal to 1 in order to find points that lie outside of this margin zone. For a positive example, this should result in a positive sign distance multiplied with a positive class membership. Hence, this uh, relation here will also hold if this margin area here is actually kept free. So we can now see that this entire optimization problem here can be written into a constraint way where we seek to minimize the length of our normal vector while preserving all of those constraints, meaning that all of these constraints here have to be fulfilled and that no points lie in this margin zone. This case is often also described as the so-called hard margin case. One disadvantage of this case is that we cannot find decision boundaries that fulfill this entire optimization problem if our two classes are not linearly separable. So imagine that these classes would have a slight overlap zone, then this problem cannot be solved anymore. In order to relax that, the so-called soft margin support vector machine has been developed. We see that this also is a constraint optimization problem, but we introduce another set of variables, the so-called slack variables denoted as xi here. So what we seek to do is we still want to minimize the length of our normal vector, and at the same time, we want to minimize the sum of our slack variables xi. Now, the slack variables have to fulfill a couple of additional constraints. First of all, we seek to find only slack variables that are positive or equal to zero. Now, we also relax our previous constraint by introducing this slack variable here on the right hand side, meaning that we can find such a slack variable and allow a little bit of confusion. So we have a, a small value that if we pick it small enough, just allows us to violate this constraint a little. So that is the idea of the slack variable. So we give some slack to this uh, maximum margin constraint. Now, if we consider a special case of those slack variables, we can choose them in the following way. We could simply set our slack variables to this formulation here. So if we look at this, these slack variables will always be positive because we enforce that with the maximum operator and the zero here. So no negative slack variables will be allowed, which automatically will enforce the follow this second constraint on positivity of slack variables. If we look closely, we can also see that here on the right hand side, we slim simply have the signed distance to the hyperplane multiplied with the class membership and subtracted from one. This means that the slack variable in the case of a violation of the constraint will simply push back our misclassified position 
to the very hyperplane. So this is essentially the smallest amount of slack variable that you can find in the case of a confusion. So building on this concept, we can now use those previous slack variables and introduce them into the original optimization problem here. Now, as our slack variables I already know they're always positive, so the bottom constraint here is always fulfilled. And because they always move the point just back to the actual um, classification boundary, this second constraint here will also will be fulfilled in all constraints. Hence, our optimization problem now takes the following form. So we still want to minimize the magnitude of our normal vector and now we can introduce the definition of our slack variable and put this guy in here and if you look very closely you will realize that this is nothing else than the introduction of a hinge loss into our original loss function so here this part here is exactly a variant of the hinge loss that we introduced earlier while we just add it to our original loss function. So here we have essentially a weighted loss function that introduces an L2 loss in combination with a hinge loss. Actually, there's even more to that. So we can also show that this is, has equivalence to the hard margin case under some constraints, but um, we refer to further literature at this point. You will see that you can actually find that in reference one at the end of the set of slides. So what we've seen so far is that we can formulate uh, our support vector machines, the soft margin case support vector machines um, with the hinge loss. And we essentially find a very short uh, objective function that we now can optimize with terms of gradient descent. And this also gives us the flexibility to build things like support vector machines into neural networks. One downside of what we have seen is here, we get, we lose the notion of this constraint optimization problem that is typically solved with Lagrangian multipliers. And based on the Lagrangian multipliers, then the actual concept of support vectors is derived. And this concept of duality and the entire mechanism of the support vectors are lost in this formulation. Nonetheless, this gives us a very powerful tool to integrate our constraints into deep networks quite easily, and we can use standard um, gradient-based optimization technology in order to optimize these loss functions. So as I already told you, you can read up more details in Vincent Christline's uh, PhD thesis that is given as reference one. Okay, so let's expand on this concept a little more and now go ahead and introduce something that I call the user loss. So the user loss can be employed in situations where it's very difficult to describe the actual loss function of the problem. Consider a case you want to adjust the filters of some image processing problem and you don't know what the optimal image looks like. So the only thing that you can do in this case is you can ask your user whether he likes or dislikes a certain image. And this has potential applications in interventional imaging where you have different users and different users have different tastes and uh, different ideas how an optimal image should look like. So the main problem here is, and what we would like to do in typical neural network training, is we would like to set up a loss function, possibly an L2 loss, where we simply take the output of the neural network and subtract it from the optimal image that our user would prefer. Now the problem is, users typically cannot produce the optimal image. So you cannot ask your user to produce the optimal image that he has in his mind. So the only thing that you can actually do is you can show him different options, different versions of images shown in the figure above here, where we have different variants of the same filter uh, 
and then the user gets to select one. Now we still have the problem that we do not know the actual optimal image that is preferred by our user. Still, we can estimate that there must be a difference between the optimal image and the currently selected one. So while we can't actually compute this error here, we can actually find that by selecting one of the images, we imply constraints on the other images, meaning that the distance to the optimally preferred image must be higher in all of the other images. So clicking at image number two implies three additional constraints. It implies that the cost or the error introduced by version number zero, number one, and number three is higher than the cost that is incurred by the selection of number two. So how we can reuse that? One major problem is that we have to provide a lot of training data typically for deep learning problems. So we do not want users to click hundreds or thousands of times on images. So what we actually want to do is we want to work with only few parameters. And here we adopt the idea of precision learning that actually allows us to combine traditional signal processing with deep learning methods. And we approximate here the algorithm of a Laplacian filter pyramid that takes subsequent low pass filtering and subtractions of those to construct a Laplacian pyramid in which thresholding is applied and then the image is recombined to form the denoised image. The beauty of this approach is that we only have a couple of free parameters. In this particular case, three different low pass filters that can be parameterized by only the sigma value, so the standard deviation of the Gaussian filter, and the thresholding that is indicated here by epsilon 1, 2, and 3 that picks different thresholds in order to suppress noise. Then we can recombine this to the denoised image. And the beauty of the precision learning approach is that we can put this entire process here into a neural network and then only optimize for those six parameters using your favorite deep learning library. So let's go ahead and see what we need to do next. So Ideally, our net needs to mimic this ideal image. So we can now replace the previous ideal image with the output of our neural network and still compare it to the user selected outputs. So once the user selected, we can now see that again, if we select the two, that we have to be able to produce these following three constraints. So the output of our neural network must be closer to two than any of the other three. Now we can rewrite this into um, inequalities below zero. And those inequalities here can be expressed using the maximum operator. So you can see that we can now pick up this original constraint of the hinge loss and use it to formalize a constraint optimization that is implied by the clicks of our user. Technically, we could only use the hinge loss as a kind of optimization problem, but you see that the hinge loss also has very large areas where the gradient is zero, so it only carries a limited amount of information. The other thing, that we could employ as a loss function is use only the best image. So what we would do is we would only pull the loss into the direction of the best user selected image. Now this of course has the disadvantage that we do not use this information that the user did not select the other three. So what we can also do now is we can construct the so-called hybrid loss 
where we want to pull towards the user selected image and at the same time we want to enforce that the other three constraints are met. Now if you look at this loss function this is an L tool term and here we essentially have again a hinge loss so you could argue that this loss function is very very similar to the one that we have already seen in the support vector machine. Now let's use that and take a look at a couple of results. And what we can see here is that we trained user dependent parameters for a specific user with the three loss functions. And as expected, the constraint only version very quickly converged and it produced um, rather unstable results. For the other case, where we had only the best case image, we also get rather quickly convergence, but we can also see that we have very, very similar parameters that are being trained. So the hybrid loss here allows us to mix the two, takes a couple of more iterations to train, uh, but we can show that we can actually get rather low and stable training results here. And now we can employ this and train the same parameters for different users. And you can also see that we are able to identify different optimal parameters using the hybrid loss for different users, which is also a very interesting observation. So actually there's even more to that and you could review additional results in reference number two. I hope you had fun during this short video tutorial and I hope that it gives you some ideas how you can combine constraint optimization into the paradigm of deep learning and how to adjust your deep learning problems such that you can very easily embed constraint optimization in your gradient descent procedures. So thank you very much for listening. And here are the references that I promised. The dissertation by Vincent Christline that has a very nice description of the relation between the hinge loss and the support vector machines. Then um, this paper here by Schachab that introduces this user loss and additional results. Um, and then we have the paper here on precision learning and use of known operators in neural networks that is also a very nice read and gives a very nice introduction on how to reuse prior knowledge in a deep learning concept.